So what I'm going to do is illustrate with the control flow the Hoare versus Mesa semantics, and then we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of each. So in this case, I'm going to have two threads. Okay, the first step is that assume thread one is waiting on a condition X, and thread two is already the monitor, and thread two calls signal. Okay, so thread one is waiting on a condition. This is step one. Then thread two is running function four, and then thread two proceeds, and then thread two signals. Okay, so that's the signal that comes in. What happens next is what separates all the semantics of the two types of monitors. In this one, we're going to look at the horse semantics where T2 gives up the monitor. This is T2, this is T1. Okay. So T2 gives up the monitor. So T1 starts running. Okay. It finishes what it needs to do and then finally releases the lock. And then T1 gives up the monitor and then T2 is used. So thing is first T2 controls, then T1 finishes, and then T2 resumes. Right. Note that in the meantime, T2 is not running. So this in this phase, there's nothing running on T2. Okay. Let's look at the MESA ones. So MESA one similarly, T1 is waiting on the condition. T2 is running right now, and T2 signals. Note what's going to happen next. T1 resumes and finishes, and but in the meantime, T2 hasn't stopped. It still continues to run. And so T2 hasn't really given up the lock um, or the CPU. It just calls signal. That's it. In the previous case, it was expected to give up the lock, the CPU, to the waiter. In this case, it just calls signal. It makes a best effort to tell the person that at some point in the near future, uh, the lock is going to be released and the CPU resources will be available for this thread to run. But it does not say when. So T1 waits. It gets a chance to run at some point in the future. It takes over the monitor by ch checking the condition again, and then runs. Okay, and then D1 finishes. But in the meantime, D2 could continue to run. It could do whatever. It could even notify and then not release the lock. It has the option. Okay. So the big trade-off is with Hor. In general, it's just cleaner and good for proofs. Um, and the conditional variables kind of signal does not change. You know, so you you have this explicit handoff. And it's easier to write correctness proofs. But it's really inefficient in implementation because you need the strong guarantee that when someone notifies or signals another thread about the monitor, this one hands it over. So you not only signal to the other person to wake back up and check the condition again, it actually gives up the monitor to the other thread, which is a stronger implementation. So in this case, you would use the if, and the if is sufficient because once you wake back up from the waiting, you can just proceed immediately. In the in the Mesa or the Hansen style monitors, signaling is only a hint that the condition may be true. You need to check again uh, before proceeding, and the benefit is that it's just easier to implement. And in this case, you would use the while. So not the while for the Mesa ones, and not the if for the whole ones. So in this case. You would always check the condition again. In this case, the in the horror case, you would just uh, proceed to the next next step or the next instruction. Monitors in general have a lot of different challenges that need they need to encounter. Okay. So I'm going to just go over a couple of them. So one example is what if there are nested monitor calls, right? So in this case, the Coke machine example. You're not just waiting on the cock machine, but there's a person who's unloading the truck. Okay, what if the person unloading the truck also wants a cock, but the machine itself is empty, and the machine will be empty until the person uh, puts cock in the machine, but the person will not put cock in the machine because he's still thirsty for a glass of cock. How do you deal with such situations? So nested monitor calls are always troublesome. Okay. So this is a classic example where really you know both of we're waiting on each other, right? So coke available to our weight and then not full our weight. Right. So I'm gonna be deposit and deposit calls uh, you know when to, when it calls a truck unload aspect and the truck unload aspect does this coke available dot weight. And now you're just waiting because there's no coke on the machine. This step 
essentially won't run at all. Okay, so uh, the step that adds the coke to the machine will never run uh, because the system will never get there because truck unload is kind of deadlocked on itself. So this one is kind of waiting, and that won't happen until you know this step happens, and this won't happen until so you just deadlock with yourself. Okay, and the other problems are things like priority inversion where uh, classical priority inversion is, in this case, I've used three processes and you have P1 and P3 talking to the monitor M. P3 is the highest priority process. Okay, so P3 uh, greater than P1, P3 greater than P2. Okay, so both P3 is greater than both these things. All right, then you could have a case where P1 enters the monitor, P1 is preempted by P2, P2 is preempted by P3, know that P3 has the highest priority. P3 tries to enter the monitor and just waits for the lock. It can't get the monitor because P1 has already entered the monitor. So the person holding the highest priority does not have the monitor uh, and he won't release the CPU because he has the highest priority and the lower priority process which has entered the monitor continues to wait. So this is another uh, a classical example of priority inversion where Essentially, um, the lower priority process holds the critical mo you know, monitor or lock resource. A way to avoid this is by essentially um, downgrading P3's priority. So you either downgrade P3's priority, hence bringing it to the same level as P1 and P2, as long as it doesn't get the monitor, or you upgrade P1's priority. So increase its priority because it has the monitor. So increase the priority of the process that has the monitor. Other topics that are challenging with monitors is exceptional handling. So what if a process waiting in a monitor needs to get out? Right? So without you know notifying, how does it have to notify everyone else around the system? Uh, then there are naked notifies where we miss out on a notify because we aren't in the queue yet. Um, how do we synchronize with devices that do not grab monitor locks but can notify conditional variable? Right, so I don't use the lock itself, but I start notifying other systems. And in general, a lot of other issues um, which are not which are carried over from an artifact of using locks. Right? So in conclusion. Monitors represent the logic of the program. They wait if necessary, signal when the condition changes so that any waiting threads waiting on the condition can proceed. Uh, the basic structure is of a monitor program is you have a lock, unlock region, and within that you have a while loop where you check the condition that you need to wait on, and if so, wait on the condition. And then someone else who also holds the lock signals, and they subsequently unlock.